This is a Q Media production. Leading and navigating change across a business can be overwhelming. So many leaders are handed a project by their board or CEO, and suddenly they're expected to create the vision, inspire their team, navigate roadblocks, and make some really hard decisions. It can feel like you're swimming in the ocean at night, not knowing which way to go. So how is a leader supposed to know how to drive change? The challenge is, there's no course or dummy's guide to leading change, until now. This is your crash course in leading change, and I'm your guide, Lauren Ryder. In this podcast, you'll learn from top C-suite and executive leaders who've driven impactful change across their organizations. No matter what project you're leading, maybe it's a sales transformation or a restructure or a digital transformation, either way, The approach to leading change is the same. It all starts with an inspirational leader, and that's you. Today on the podcast, we have Friska Wirja, the CEO of Fresh by Friska. She's a consultant, speaker, and facilitator for teams and executives. She has an impressive background, which includes many awards. She's a TEDx speaker and an author who's just released her first book. She has 10 years of lived experience in change management and transformation for large organizations. Today on the podcast, she shares her model for driving change through engagement and play with lots of valuable advice and fun stories. Hi, Friska. Thanks for being here. Thanks for the invite. I think this is uh, the best change collaboration that we have seen so far. Oh, totally. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's been waiting for it. <laughs> All right. So... I really want to hear about what you've been working on because you, I know you've done this incredible TEDx talk mm-hmm. and I would love to hear all about that. So I watched it. It was fabulous. Thank it was you. all about what you call future fitness. Mm. I want to hear all about it. How did you get around to this? Oh, well, okay. I had come across, I think, four people in one week and they just met me and literally all of them said, you should do a TED talk. And the way to get me um, excited is to put a goal in front of me. And I was like, fine, I'm going to do a TED Talk. So I went on the TED website, started, uh, did some searching. What are the events um, happening in Sydney? And unfortunately, all the Sydney events had closed for speakers. Melbourne was still open. So I applied for Melbourne and answered the questions, which is essay format. So what's your one big idea? Why does the world he- need to hear about this right now? Why are you the best person to hear about it? Um, five days later, got a really long email from the TEDx organisers. And you know how really long emails usually mean you've been rejected? I initially thought, oh, I didn't get it. That's it. But I dug a little deeper and actually I had been accepted, but just not for the talk that I wanted to talk about. So initially, I actually wanted to talk about diversity and inclusion and what it's like growing up in this country when you look like this. And it was very challenging in the 80s. Um, The organisers did some LinkedIn stalking, did some Googling, and they said, look, you've got a really long, rich background in digital transformation, in change management. Would you mind resubmitting your TED Talk to talk about that? Uh, Took me, you know, 0.5 seconds to say, yep, sure. (laughs) (laughs) And so I did, ended up doing the TED Talk on what I do for a living, what I've been doing for the past 10 years, which is helping very large organisations build their future fitness muscles. And when I say future fitness, it means, you know, the future, and even today, has been characterised by change, right? Technological change, medical change, uh, ecological change, sustainability, financial change, all of that. Everything's in constant flux. You can't be ready for that sort of environment if you don't work on your fitness. And your fitness means your adaptability, your openness to change, your innovation and agility. So that's what I do. So I'm sure there's a lot of people listening who probably have thought, I want to do a TED Talk. Mm. So I'm listening to you going, wow, tell me a little bit more. Like how, you obviously put something in on a website, but what was the actual process of coming up with your speech and what you were going to talk about? Um, So I was a bit different. Everybody else already had their topic. So I was given a topic, but usually each TED event has a theme and you submit a proposal that fits with that theme. Um, and so the, the process is you write a script and it needs to get approved by the TED gods in New York two months before you get on stage. And there is no room for improvisation at all because literally word for word gets submitted and it gets approved. And if you deviate from that, you run the risk of your talk never making it onto social media. 
So yeah, that that's pretty much the process. And you know, a lot of people comment on how natural it is, how the hand gestures match the the um, the words. And you know, it was challenging because there's no slides, there's no props, there's no nothing. So it's just you on stage on that red dot. So you had to memorize every single word of that. Every single word verbatim and also make sure it's congruent with the actions that I was doing. And, you know, why does it look natural? It's because I worked my ass off. It's because I rehearsed two hours a day for about six weeks before the actual day. And, you know, I did a lot of reading on previous people that have done TED Talks, for example, Tim Ferriss, and he suggested practicing your talk in different locations at home because the body tricks you. If you always practice in the study, when you suddenly are on the TED stage, you're not in your study anymore. Your body thinks that you've actually forgotten, but you haven't. So I I was everywhere. I was in the study. I was at the dining room. I was in the bedroom. When I was power walking around Centennial Park, when I was doing the grocery shopping, I'm sure a lot of people thought I was crazy talking to myself, but I was rehearsing. (laughs) So it's not natural. It's practice, practice, practice until it's perfect. And for those people that get nervous before public speaking or whatnot, it's because you haven't done enough work. If you've done that amount of work, there is no room for nerves. Like it's locked into your brain. So if we take that back to sort of the leadership arena, you know, we've got probably a lot of leaders listening Mm. saying, I I get really nervous every time I get up on stage. Sounds like it's just about practice and rehearsal. It is just about practice. And you really have to believe in it. Like a lot of change initiatives have fallen flat. It's because of the way that it's been delivered, right? It's not the words you say, it's it's how you say it. It's very, very true. People can sense um, incongruence and inauthenticness a mile away. So they, they know whether you believe in a change or not. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So now your TED talk went really, really well. Mm. So I think I think I last time I checked, it was about top 1%. Yeah, on the, in the technology talks, yep. Yeah, it made it onto TED.com. That yeah. is really amazing. Where did it take you? Uh, let's see. I've had two speaking engagements in Singapore, uh, one in Dubai. It led to being featured in the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, as of yesterday, I actually got a message from Prestige Indonesia wanting to feature me as well. And I've since expanded on the talk and I've turned it into a book. Wow, that is incredible. Tell me a little bit more about this book. I mean, everybody that's watched it, really loves it. And they ask for more details. So, for example, the three principles I lay out at the end, principles that should underpin your transformation, it's prism, play and production. What does that mean? How does that translate into real life? And so, you know, prism is means viewing transformation from the human experience, right? Don't worry about speeds and feeds. We need to talk about feelings and fears because change happens at an individual level. So how do you have deep empathy for the people that are expected to change and how do you make sure that's a guiding principle in your transformation? So that's prism. Play means, you know, humans are hardwired to fear change and it protected us way back when in the prehistoric area. So we haven't evolved much since then, but what will combat the fear of the new? It's play, it's curiosity. So how can you put the F word, fun, into your transformation to reduce the fear to experiment? And lastly, production, like putting together a transformation. It is like a star-sided production. You need a really good director, so a seasoned change expert, to make sure all the actors of the transformation are in place, the business analysts, the testers, you know, every man and his dog. So it is like putting together a production. You need the right people at the right time in the right place to get the whole experience. So how, how do those principles translate in real life? So I go into that into a lot more detail. And also I find that a lot of change books, they're either, they're very academic and they're usually written by people that have lots of letters after their name, but no real world experience driving change, no scars, no bruises. And so I've done this for 10 years. Like I've had people, you know, 10 centimeters from my face yelling at me full pelt because they were losing their car parking privileges. When I talk about things, it's because I've actually experienced it. It's a lived experience. I'm talking sharing about that and also a lot of um, case studies and thought-provoking analysis. Let's go into a couple of those. 
So we all want to nail our strategy, right? But here's the thing I've picked up from working with growing companies. Their leaders aren't always singing the same tune, processes are not built to win, and there's a few key people who could use some skill boosting. The reality is, to make this happen, you've got to get three things in sync. People, processes, and systems. Now here's a smart move to keep that growth growing strong. Dive into our transformation and change programs or a professional development program for your people. Our team have worked with some of the world's biggest businesses, giving them clear ways of working, upskilling their leaders, and taking all their headaches away from wondering if they're doing it right. We only have limited spots each year, so inquire at our site, www.leading-edge.global, and mention you heard it from this podcast. Mm. I want to hear some of those case studies because, I mean, that's what this podcast has been about. All of our change leaders have come in and we said, what went well, mm. what didn't, you know, what are the, some, some of the biggest learnings that you've had that you share with us? Um, there's, you can talk as much as you want, but there's nothing like a lived experience to change people's minds. So I'll, I'll give you an example. The most challenging change project that I was on, it didn't last long, it was probably about nine months. Um, but it nearly broke me. And it's because I was the fifth consultant in the door. It was a public sector client, very, very old school. And what made it more complex was the change was happening in many areas at the same time. New CEO, new building. So that was the change. So they were uh, detonating their old office in the CBD, which was very convenient. Everybody took the train to get there to a brand spanking new building 45 minutes away limited public transport options, minimal parking, not much infrastructure. And the gossip and the rumors surrounding this was at an all time high. And I thought I can talk till I'm blue in the face, but they will never believe me. So adopting the principle of play, how do I make this fun for them? And it's even more challenging because I wasn't given a great deal of budget. I said, okay, I need to get creative. So I actually drove there and I went around to all the local businesses and I said, look, as you know, this government department is gonna be moving in in a few months. I wanna organize like some sort of fun day out for them. Do you think you can offer me anything? And because they were new businesses, they were so open. They were like, yep, so, you know, get coffee vouchers, get calendars, da, 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 all these little things. Like it, they weren't expensive, but it meant that someone cared for their needs like maps, dry cleaning vouchers, et cetera. And I thought, okay, that's one thing done. Way to make them feel special without spending any money. And then, right, what am I going to do? What, what's the main source of gossip? And the main source of gossip is that it's too far. Public transport was unsafe. It's complicated to get there, blah, 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 blah. I was like, okay. So I negotiated with the public transport authority for discounted transport cards. Wow. How did that go? <laughs> really? I literally, I felt like Karate Kid, like, Swipe on, swipe off. This is how you take the train, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of them had never taken public transport before. And I literally took them with me 20 at a time on the train. <laughs> it was like, like, like a free school. Yeah, I did. I felt like a tour guide. Like, where's my brolly? <laughs> it was Whoa. exactly like preschool. They were, sig- they were all significantly older than me. Um, and then when I got there, it was like, a tour. You know, I had the building manager teach them the new security processes. I had the IT people um, showing them their new screens. You know, the architect was there talking. And then we did a little look-see of all the surrounding business. And then I gave them the goodie bags. And then when they were on the train back, it's like they were really happy. They were buzzing. And when they got back, it wasn't me singing the changes praises. It was them telling their other peers saying, hey, you know what? It was actually wasn't that bad. And um, the week after, it really meant a lot because one of the um, elderly gentlemen that was on the cohort that I took, he said, you know what, Frisca, after you took me on that, I took my granddaughter to ride the train and it was amazing. She loved it. <laughs> loved it. You know, but like who goes to that effort? Yeah. Usually it's like, here's, read an email, this is what's happening, pack up your shit and then we're going. That's the change. That's so, right, yeah. You know, but like. I always tell people, oh, it takes longer the way you do it, or it's too much effort, blah, blah, blah. Well, you can spend a reasonable amount of time engaging your people, or you can spend an unreasonable amount of time being crippled all the way to the very end, people kicking and screaming. So which one do you want? Yeah. Like your choice. The whole goes all the way back to the carrot and the stick, Mm. isn't it? 
it's just so much easier to get someone through a carrot to say great things are going to happen if you do it this way yep. rather than yep. if you don't do it, it's all going to go down. Yeah. Like, don't get me wrong. It, it wasn't like smooth sailing after that, but those dissenters were no longer loud and proud, you know, and so it, it neutralized their negativity. So when you do have dissenters, though, so on, on any project, have you found ways to, A, find them? Because as we say, the loud and proud ones, I think, are actually really great because you find them, you quiet them down, you, you deal with it. Mm. The quiet ones, those are the harder ones to deal with. Have you found any t- tips or tricks that uh, you can, A, find them and then B, deal with it? Uh, ask a lot of questions. Have a Make sure you have a really good change network because you're the newbie on the block. Usually you're the external consultant. People have been there five, 10 years. You don't have the inside info that they do. So find those people who may not be the, the you know, subtle covert gossipers, but they are your eyes and ears. Yeah. So, so that, that whole network. And I guess can that network, I suppose, can be formal or informal, hey? I It's informal for me. Yeah. Yeah. So there's your formal change agent network where they're your two-way conduit to particular teams and business units. And then there's the informal ones who are pretty much your little birdies that are in every room like watching out for you. But that doesn't happen unless you've got the credibility, unless you've got the support of the entire C-suite. So those are very important to have in place first before you start building your informal networks. Absolutely. Mm. So when... You go into organisations and obviously you're saying getting the the, um, agreement from the C-suite and getting that support to actually do it the way that you need to do it. Do you ever come across when the C-suite, there's somebody in there who's not really on board? All the freaking time. (laughs) All the freaking time. And um, I think you just have to have the hard conversations with the CEO. Mm -hmm. Um, It's like, look, this is what we've observed. So, you know, you have a choice. You can either try to coach this person or if they're not going to come on board, you have to sub them out because who's around your boardroom table matters a lot. They can either be your castle of change or it's going to be a church of complacency. And when you're complacent, you're not going to be around that much longer. Actually, you just mentioned boards and mm. it reminded me there's an article I recently read that you wrote. Mm. Um, it's for the company director magazine, right? That's yeah. right. Yeah. And you talked about a new role in the boardroom. Mm. Tell us about that. It's called Change is the Next Normal. Um, And, you know, if you flick through the headlines of any newspaper, everything's changing. Legislation's changing. uh, Environmental issues are changing. um, Customer experience is changing. Employee experience is changing, especially technological change. We don't have to even talk about that. Like every week there's a new AI platform to get your head around. If we all acknowledge that change is happening all the time, it's complex. I mean, look at COVID for God's sake. Doesn't it make sense to have a chief change officer around the leadership table? All right, 10 years ago, no one had heard of a chief digital officer or a chief customer officer. I think this is the next executive that's needed because all these changes impact somebody. And as change professionals, we are taught to have a deep level of empathy, cognitive empathy and emotional empathy. And it's that empathy that allows us to create the conditions that allow adoption to thrive. That is such an incredible idea. I love that. Um, I just, I can only imagine having somebody with that viewpoint on the, in, on the boardroom and actually, mm. you know, influencing all of their mates and, and all their peers across the board. I think that's great. Tell us a bit more. How did you come up with this concept? I was sick of people perceiving change as a nice to have, something to do when, hey, I've got some extra budget, let's throw some comms in there or whatnot. But it's not, it's a strategic function that propels an organization forward because, I mean, you can't have progress without change and you can't change without progress. So they're kind of, you know, two sides of the same coin. So how are we gonna do this? We, we need to figure out a way, we need to, I love that you're in the company directors magazine, We're going to have to get this out there. Yeah. I mean, like all the hot issues that they're worried about, which is, you know, cybersecurity, um, diversity and inclusion, all that stuff is about change. And if you have someone that's focused on how to shepherd key stakeholders from apathy, awareness, right through to not just acceptance, but commitment, but advocacy, like you're going to be head and shoulders above your competitors. Absolutely. I love that. You just mentioned a minute ago about AI and the AI projects. Have Mm -hmm. you seen those coming into organisations? 
for very large organizations, a lot of people are confused. They don't know which tool to use when. For smaller organizations, they're very much into experimenting. So a friend of mine has um, a virtual agency based in the Philippines and her clients are starting to ask her, are your assistants AI trained? Because they know now what used to take five hours for a VA to do something with AI, it'll take half that. And they're they're more sophisticated and then they're not willing to pay for non-trained, non-AI trained VAs. That's really interesting. Mm. So really talk to that whole capability piece and Mm. and what does the future structure capability um, look like for an organisation? Yeah. So do you think that if, you know, we're talking about smaller organisations, maybe talking about smaller chatbots or, or, you know, implementations across an organisation, large ones, I know I've seen a lot of automation Mm. coming in, that's Mm. kind of was their initial form of AI. Do you think the change programs themselves would be different depending on the size of the organization? I think so. I think for smaller organizations, change happens faster and usually they have a one page, well, the ones that I've created for smaller organizations, it's a one page change canvas, literally to get all the key stakeholders on the same page. What's the change about? How are we gonna support people? What does success look like? What are some corrective measures? What are the budgets, et cetera? Whereas longer change programs, multi-year, for example, ERP implementations. Um, I just wrapped up one last year and that was a very detailed, in-depth change management strategy because it was very technical. Mm. With AI, you don't need to have all that technical customization and configuration. Yeah, it's a sure. lot fa- The cycles I find are a lot faster. So that means the knowledge and ability needs to happen faster. Like if we think of the traditional ad car model that everybody knows, you start with awareness, desire, you know, knowledge, ability, reinforcement, when the change is ha- happening faster, you circle knowledgeability, knowledgeability really fast. So as soon as someone knows something, they need to quickly get up to speed and build the skills to use it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, that's really interesting. Hey guys, I've had a lot of people asking me questions about leadership, high performing teams and business trends. So I've created the Leading Edge Brief, which is like having a cup of coffee with me in your email. Sign up today on our website, leading-edge.global. It's the best way to stay connected and keep up with any upcoming events, updates, and all the good stuff. Now back to the podcast. You talked a bit before Mm -hmm. about the concept of play, which I love. And we always talk about gamification. It can be really you know, difficult, I think, sometimes for, to be creative and actually come up with that when, you know, you're trying to roll out, I don't know, a technology project. It doesn't seem like it should be fun. Yeah, yeah. Give us some examples of some really cool things that you've done in that space. Okay. Uh, first, I'll give you a big, a real world example, which is Google. So Google was having trouble getting people to submit um, financial receipts on time in order to get reimbursement. So they gamified it and they had a leaderboard, et cetera, and they found that they achieved 90% compliance within those timeframes. So that's something really boring, um, but when it comes to fun play principles that I've incorporated in my projects, um, I remember one of them was for the WA police. Um, and so everybody on the project team and also the change agent network, and there were a lot of them, there were 130, we came up with a game where um, you had to create your own, kind of like an about me, and you could make it as detailed as possible. You could have your photo, your favorite food, favorite CD, da, da, da. And people were so creative about that. And we we, um, gave away prizes to win. Um, Another play that we did was, because it was a long project, it was two years. And like you said, when it's that long, how do you sustain the momentum? We did simple things like um, lunchtime workouts and they were always team-based workouts and that incorporated an element of play. Um, Every month we had a fancy dress-up award. Again, that incorporated play. Now, when it came time to demo the system, it was not interesting. Like, oh my God, like, you know, send a police horse here, (laughs) program a helicopter here, respond to a triple zero call here. So I was like, God, how do I make it interesting? I thought, okay, and I sat down with the two superintendents that were leading it, some call takers and dispatchers, like, right, well, what are your ideas? What do you think? I wanted to co-create it with them. I, did, I didn't want it to be the Frisker show. And, and, and I said, look, tell me what are the four most common scenarios that you encounter? I'm like, okay, it's like, you know, robbery, hostage situation, 
stolen vehicle and I can't remember what the other one was. I was like, great. I said, we're going to do a skit. <laughs> <laughs> and we literally did a skit. We People were real-life cops and call takers, acted it out. I even got the commander, for God's sake, to play a robber. <laughs> and there was a big screen in the back showing what to input in the new system to get it to do what you wanted it to do. And people were cackling their asses off. Like, it was so fun. It was so memorable. And the people that um, came to that off-site they all went back to the stations and started creating a buzz out of it. So th that's that. I love that. And something organic that I didn't do, I would love to say I claim credit for it, is nifty tips and tricks. So I think one of the police officers just put a 30-second selfie video of him talking, saying, hey, guys, did you know that you can do this in this new system? Look, it's amazing. Bang, dropped it on Yammer. And people started kind of wanting to outdo his um, tip. So never underestimate the power of competitive spirit. I love that. Mm. You actually just said you had a change network of 130 people. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so A, how on earth do you control that? Mm. And what were the, I, I'm really interested in this concept because, you know, I've definitely used formal change agents before in the past. Yeah. Sometimes it works better than others. So yeah. I, I'm interested, A, how did you get this all together to be working together in the yeah. same way? Yeah. And, you know, what did you have them use for? Uh, so why I had so many is because there are literally that many police stations and many types, right? There's water police, there's canine police, mounted police. So I had to make sure I had one representative in each office. That's why we had that many. Um, what I use them for is creative thing. Oh, here's another example of um, play. We needed a project name so, and uh, ran a competition on A, project name, and then B, design the logo. So use them for that. Um, obviously, two-way information. I would s create monthly updates, monthly newsletters. They would forward it and talk about it with their teams. Uh, they would also be really great observers and feedback data to me saying, hey, this person's not really on board. Um, the comms for this one missed the mark for this particular group. So, yeah, they, they were very good. Um, we only met face-to-face -face each quarter just because it's so difficult. And, you know, they're they're working 24 seven, they're, they're on the beat, they're keeping people like you and I safe. So I couldn't keep on dragging them out, out, out of um, the station every month. So yeah, once a quarter, but every month without fail, we'd, we'd have a chat. And I'd run two sessions um, because there were two shifts, uh, morning, sh morning and evening. Yeah. yeah. That's really interesting. Um, I, re I reflect back on a Change Champion Network that I once created, mm. That, but it was the, the change ended up being a culture change. It wasn't mm. supposed to be initially, but it ended up being a culture change. Yeah. And it was interesting because I actually found that using a change network for that wasn't as effective as mm. what I had thought it would be in my mm. head when, when we created it. Um, I ended up using the leaders for that. Yeah. And that worked really well. And, and, and I think, you know, looking back, that is how it should be. But I, I'm asking you, have you ever tried using change, a formal change network to um, do culture change? And has it worked? Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> and and not, nothing wrong with the with the people that were in the change um, agent network, but it's because the CEO was absent mm. and you can't expect a culture change if the person at the top isn't also changing. Yeah. If, if they're only the ones pointing down, say, you, you do the changing, then it's not going to work. Yeah. 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 That's an, it's so when you're working on a project and the CEO is not on board... I mean, how does the whole thing even work? Because that's the number one role. You have to have that person driving and leading the change. Mm. It, well, that's the whole thing. It doesn't work. And that's why culture change initiatives have such a high failure rate. Because mm. uh, often it's delegated to the head of people and culture or the w whatever other positions. But it's really non-negotiable. That It's not just the CEO, but the entire leadership team yeah. needs to be on board. So how do you, what, what would you say like your top tips for getting a really good culture change through? I'd say um, less focus on hard values and more focus on principles mm. because integrity to me or going above and beyond to me could mean something entirely different to you. So really being explicit about that, um, do the hard yards in aligning your principles with how you reward, incentivize and recognize people. Uh, so I'll give you an example. When I was at Worley, um, we launched a big offshoring program in India. So three delivery centers, Mumbai, Hyderabad, Chennai. The intent was to offshore any non-essential client facing work like drafting or you know early stage engineering designs. 
No one used it. Why? Because the people that are in charge of sending the work were the project managers. And how are they remunerated? They get their bonuses when the client's happy and it's done on time. Sending stuff to India put all those things at risk. And so, you know, more work, that took a lot longer because more work had to be done partnering with HR to review everyone's compensation. Yeah, and you can imagine that you know, those sorts of projects when people feel like, yeah, you know, my job is at risk, absolutely, you're gonna be getting pushed back. Mm. But change isn't an easy role. I mean, you're really stuck in the middle of a whirlwind. It's like like the eye of a hurricane, really, that's all around you. Yeah. I mean, have there been moments where you've kind of been pushed to the brink and gone like, why am I even here? Yeah, totally. And I think it's important in that situation to self-care and self-soothe, whatever that looks like for you. And for me, for that project, that was really hard because even just motivating myself to get out the door and go into the office was super hard. And then I just asked myself, like, in five years' time, is this really going to matter that much? And the answer is no. Like, that, I left that many, many years ago. So it's to gain perspective is really important and make sure you have um, a friendly ear that you can vent, bitch, moan, <laughs> cry, scream, yell to yeah. really help as well to kind of like defuse and yeah, I take, the, take the air out. I, agree. I think it's important yeah. to have a network of other change managers because we all know exactly what we're going totally, through. Totally, <laughs> totally. Well, thank you so much, Chris. This has been an incredible conversation and really excited to announce that your book is out now. Mm. So where can people go and find it? They can find it on all online book retailers, so Booktopia, Amazon, uh, etc. They can also download it from my website, freshbyfriska.com. Excellent. And where can they find you if they want to get in touch? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, so linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash Friska and all my socials are consistent. So Insta, TikTok, YouTube, just search for my name and you'll find me. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for coming along. Thanks really for enjoyed me. the chat.